Okay, so morning. Good to see everybody. Um, Thank you. We're going to jump right into that. Now, unfortunately, last week, I did not record the class and several people actually came to me and they said, oh, we missed it. And um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to spend five minutes on kind of recap, quick recap on what we did last week. Um, just to, uh, it's not only that, uh, you know, for the benefit of those who, uh, who were not here, uh, but also it's going to help us in kind of setting the setting, uh, all the setting for, for today. Okay. It's okay. So I'm going to ask everybody to mute and we're going to go into, into this quickly. I you have nice haircut. I have plenty of books. Those little ones are, are good. You have like, you know, your choice. Okay. Um, today is recorded. Yes. So we're going, we're going to, I'm going to spend five minutes recapping very quickly what we said last week, and then we're going to continue. Okay. That's for you, Shelly. Okay. So we said that in, in, in that process for canonizing the Tanakh, um, we uh, the last book was written around around the year uh, 450 BCE, the time of Ezra Sofer. And as we know, in our Tanakh, we're talking about 24 books. Now, that process of canonizing the whole Tanakh took hundreds of years. It seems that it was uh, completed that process around the time of the year 70, the time of the destruction of the second temple. That was part of the catalyzator, or one of the reasons why Chazal were actually driven to canonize, canonize the, the Tanakh, to make sure that other books that they were not interested in are not going to be part of the Tanakh, they're not going to become sanctified, etc. Fine. Why this is important? Why this is important? Um, because the Talmud talks about the Sefer Yechezkel, both in Masechet Chagiga and Masechet Shabbat. Um, it says, the Talmud says that there was a discussion about the book of Yechezkel, whether it should be part of the Tanakh or not. What's the problem? Two problems. One, as we're going to learn, and we know already that Yechezkel was a Kohen, so there's part of his prophecies and, and what he talks about has to do with the rituals of the temple in Beit HaMikdash. Obviously, he had some knowledge of that stuff because, you know, obviously he was a Kohen. But some of his stuff goes against the Torah. So that's number one. Problem number two was that Chazal were concerned of the fact that these are very difficult, lofty, complicated ideas like the chariot, like the dry bones, those are very famous prophecies and people might come to the wrong conclusion by learning them. So it's better to get rid of it and not to include this, the book as part of the Tanakh. However, the, the, it's part of the Tanakh because the, uh, the Talmud brings uh, the story about Hananiah, the son of Hezekiah, that sat in this attic with food and for I don't know how long, he was able to sit down and reconcile all those contra contradictions between the book of Yechezkel and the Torah. And because it was all reconciled, then it was eventually made it into the Tanakh. It's a fascinating book. It's a book that a lot of it is not familiar. Um, I am embarrassed to say that I never learned that seriously up until recently. Um, and it's a pity because it's, it's a beautiful, radical, thought-provoking uh, book. Okay, so Yechezkel begins prophesizing before the destruction of the first temple, right? However, all of his prophecies are given already in Babel. He is already in exile. He has been exiled in what we call Galut Yehoyachin, 
Galuti Oyachin is taking uh, place um, in the year 597 BCE. And Yechezkel's first prophecy is taking place five years later in the year 593 BCE. Okay. Um, let's jump right into the what we learned about in the first chapter. The first chapter is a fascinating story. It's the chariot. And he describes his visions, what he sees, the, 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 the sky open and, and, and he sees all those animals and all those, all those chariots and all those wheels and all that kind of stuff. Um, and as I said last week, we're not going to really try to understand what it means, all that stuff, because that's all Kabbalistic and stuff like that. But what we're going to try to answer today is what is the significance of him seeing that? Why this is so important? What is the significance of what, uh, of what he saw? One thing to mention that we talked about last, uh, last week is there's a problem, a tension between the first two psukim. The first pasuk talks about 30 years, and then the second pasuk talks about the fifth of the month. And most of the Mepharshim understand that there's a connection between them. We brought the two different opinions that say, that opinion one, that's the 30th year of the Jubilee. And then the second opinion said it was um, the fifth year, I'm sorry. It was, I'm sorry, it was the, the counting is from when they found the, the Torah in the times of King Yehoiachin. Either way, we have a problem with that. Our reconciliation, our explanation for that was that the first pasuk is not the opening for the second pasuk. In other words, the first pasuk is kind of the preface, is an intro. It's the time in which Yechezkel already finished giving all his prophecies and he's starting writing them down or at least transmitting them in a way that others later on and Sheikh Nisat Agdola are able to write it down. Okay, so it's like writing the book and at the end writing the intro. So the first is basically the first pasuk is 30 years that's the end of his career it's 30 years after he start prophesizing and this way we have no contradiction between um between the two okay i'm going to summarize what did we learn in the first chapter in terms of what yeheskel saw so he sees the bases of the chariot for animals and each one of them has four faces now the chariot has it's a multi-directional it's a multi-directional uh vehicle so to say and the four faces are a face of a man face of a lion a face of a bull and a face of an eagle right and those faces obviously different sides and they can go in each direction and they don't need to turn because there's always a face facing that direction. Also, the leg, as we said, is straight leg. There's no knee, so it, that they don't have to move. And in the bottom, as Rashi said, it was ofan inside ofan, i.e. a wheel inside a wheel. Okay? It's like a kind of a prism. Think about it. Like you have a wheel inside a wheel. If I had the... Um, the, um, the flyer that we made for this class. Uh, no, no, the flyer, the oh, flyer. Oh. We have it downstairs. Um, the flyer, I, I put that, that picture. This is, think about a circle, and then there's a circle inside the circle. It's kind of, think about a ball, basically like a ball. So you have like, it can go in every direction. Yeah, make sense? joystick instead of a wheel kind of a thing okay um so so you have those animals and then above them there is a rakia there is a a, a a layer okay kind of a thin layer that is he calls it 
whether it's because it's cold or because it's white, or, I don't know, something magical, think about like some sort of a magical ice, okay, above, that is above those animals, that has those balls instead of a leg, okay? You have those, that sky kind of a thingy, and above that, and above that, there's a, a, a chair and some sort of a image that represents God that sits on that chair. Okay? And when they move, so they have wings, those animals. When they move, so the wings, so they have two sets of wings. One goes up, one goes down. The, the one that goes down to cover their body, their bases, and the one that goes up, when they, so it's kind of a hovering, and that creates great noise. Okay? That's basically the description that he sees. Yes? Hmm. We just, you just call it an image, Dmut. We don't know anything about that image. Dmut, figure. Um, Udm he says, Dmut kemar e adam, correct. An image or, or figure like a man. What? Yes. Okay. So he sees that Dmut, that figure that represents God, it looks kind of a man, whatever that means, sits on that chair. That chair is above that layer, that rakia. Underneath that, we have those four animals. And the legs, so to say, of those four animals are those balls. Those balls. Okay? That's what he sees. Now the question, and this is what we covered last time. Now, the question is, what's the significance of that? And why does he see it? Right, that's a prophecy. So God wanted him to see that. The question is, what for? What does it tell us? And the answer for that we're going to find in the other two times in which Yechezkel describes the chariot, the Merkava, later on. If you look at chapters five, I'm sorry, eight through eleven. Okay, if you look at chapters eight through eleven, I hope everybody has a Sefer Yechezkel in front of them. We have plenty here, guys. If you want to come and join us in in uh, in person, we have plenty here. Um, so that, those three chapters are one long prophecy. We're going to deal with that prophecy later on. But for now, what I want to look at that prophecy is one element. Okay. That prophecy is, um, is taking place about a year after the prophecy that we talked about just now after the first prophecy in the in, in Perek Aleph. So this is about a year later. And I want to look at chapter eight, verse one. Okay. Everybody see where I am? Okay, chapter eight, verse one. Not complicated. Okay, page 50 if you have the, the little books. Okay, so he says the following. We're talking about the sixth year, right? This is how we know it's a year after because we, remember the, the first prophecy he talks about, he says in the, the fifth year. So obviously if in, we're now in the sixth year, it's a year later. I'm sitting home, and the elders of Yehuda are sitting with me. All of a sudden, I have a vision. And what happens? He gets a virtual tour 
of what's happening in Yerushalayim. So you remember, he's already where? He's already in Babel. He's already in Babel. But the prophecy, the vision that he has is gonna take him in a virtual tour, even though physically he's in Babel, and he's got guests. Ah, the elders of Yerushalayim are sitting with him in the living room, but he's gonna be taken, at least here, mentally into Yerushalayim. And what does he see? But he saw, yeah, the temple is already destroyed. I'm looking for Suk Gimel now. But he saw the Ruach Ben Haaretz Ben Hashemayim and he saw Yerushalayim in the Marot Elokim. The wind takes me, and I'm like between heaven and earth, and takes me to Yerushalayim. Now, what happens is, every time, if you can read the, the rest of the, of the chapter if you want, but I'm just going to summarize it. Every time he sees another something terrible happening, idol worshiping, and, and, and um, in terms of like the, the sins that are, take, that are happening, both in terms of where in Yerushalayim and the people that are participating in those actions, fine. Those sins that are taking place in Yerushalayim at that time that Yechezkel is seeing has two main outcomes. If you look at the next chapter, it, at Perek Tet, okay, in Perek Tet, you don't have to look at that. There is a description of this, the, the symbolic, whatever, there, there's a description of the punishment that's going to happen because of the bad stuff that he sees in chapter 8. And what's going to happen? It's six angels that are going to destroy everything in the city. Okay, that's in chapter 9. Fine. So, just to summarize, we're now in the sixth year, he's already in Babel. That's his second prophecy. He's getting a virtual tour of what's happening in Yerushalayim at the present time. At that time, things are really bad in Yerushalayim. Idol worshipping, all sorts of terrible stuff are happening in Yerushalayim. And as a result of that stuff, in the next chapter, in chapter 9, we learn that what? Six angels are going to come and destroy the whole city, whatever is left of it, after the exile. That's the one outcome. That's the physical outcome of those sins. If you flip to the next chapter, chapter 10, we see the spiritual outcome of those sins. And that is more what we're looking at. And that's what's more important for us our discussion today. What we're going to see in chapter 10 is the spiritual punishment, as I said. The spiritual punishment is what? Is the departure of the Shekhinah from Beit HaMikdash. It's not only that the building is now destroyed, it's also that God's presence who was there for 480 years, he's living. What does it mean? It means that the ruins of the Mikdash have no significance, nothing. If God's presence is not there, that could lead to a whole discussion, a whole discussion that we can you know, try to um, make it relevant to our lives. But for example, it's a simple halakhic question that comes all the time, was actually um, brought. What happens or what is the rationale or, or the halakhic permission to sell a shul? What happens, right? It's a place where you daven, a place where we believe there's God's presence. Can I sell it to a church? Can I sell it to be demolished and uh, you know somebody's going to build a whatever high riser there can i do that and the, and the answer is yes because once so there's no 
tangible sanctity, so to say, in the walls. As long as it, it's the function, if it's used for tefillah, if it's used for Torah study, it's a place, right? Then it has that sanctity. Then we can do that stuff. But once it's taken out, it's just bricks. Right, so this is like one, one idea behind that that makes it very, very relevant to today. I'm gonna take it on a philosophical level. I'm gonna take it another step. So who is the one that has the power to make it holy, whatever that means? A space? People, us. Right? Because when I built, not me, whatever, when, when somebody built, when people built this place, I think it was 1954, up until the point where they started davening here and teaching Torah and all that kind of stuff, it was just bricks. Once you do that, it becomes holy. So who is the one that actually has the power to do that? Us. That gets us to the concept of holiness. So what does it mean to be kadosh? To be separated, right? It's not saint, we're not Christians. It's, it's to be separated. What does it mean separate? Because I separated that building, this Ben Jacob, I separated from the other buildings. I separate with my actions, I designated to be a place of tefillah, of holiness. And because of that, because of my action, because of my separation, it becomes holy. But once I separate, once I do not separate it, because I take the, I replace it with another building or whatever that is, it's just bricks. And I can do whatever I want with that. And therefore I can sell it, I can demolish it and whatever. Make sense? Yes? Okay. Those are like stuff that we learned from, Beit HaMikdash is a little bit different. I know what you're gonna ask me, right? Beit HaMikdash, whoa, whoa, what about the Kotel? Right? Okay. So, right. so there's a huge, huge, I didn't want to go into that. I'm going to make it very short. There's a huge machloket. On one hand, on one end, you have the Rambam. And the Rambam says that Harabite, Temple Mount, is in a different category. Once it was sanctified, can no longer lose its sanctity ever again. And therefore, also the Kotel, also Temple Mount, even though we believe that Shechina left it, it's still holy. Others disagree. And therefore they say, as a historic reference, yes, but it doesn't have any, anything. Third approach says, no, 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 no. Even the second temple, remember, Cheska, we're talking about after the first temple. Uh, so, you know, after the first temple was the second temple. So, we believe that the Shekhinah went back. And Cheska is talking about that, by the way. Cheska is not talking only about the second temple. Cheska is going to talk about the third temple at the end of the book on chapters uh, 40 to 48. But the kind of a middle of the road approach says, once it was sanctified with the second, the, second, uh, the second time, with the second temple, it never left. And it cannot leave, why? Because there was always Jewish community um, in Israel. What do you do with that? Good luck, whatever you want. Okay, but you can at least understand the different approaches when it comes to Harabite, when it comes to the Kotel. Some people feel it's whatever, some people feel it's, you know, emotional, historical, some people feel it's mystical and has all those power, super, take it whatever you want, talk to your local rabbi about that. Okay, I'm trying to give all approaches. Okay. I want to delve into the description of what Yechezkel says when he sees actually the Shekhinah leave the temple. 
So let's take a look at um, Perek Yud, we're on chapter 10, verse four. I apologize, I don't have English uh, with me. Maybe I should. Steve, can I bother you to give me? Uh, yeah, 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 the, the, that. Or you know what? We'll, we'll put uh, you to work. You're gonna read the English. You're gonna read the English. I don't sorry, I have the Hebrew. Okay. You're gonna read the English. Okay. My first language. It's fine. So I think you can handle it. You're gonna read the English, I'm gonna read the Hebrew. Works? Okay, so we're in chapter 10, verse 4. Vayarom Kevoda Donai Ma'ala Kru, Al Miftan Habait, Vay Malea Bait at He Anan, the Hechatzer Malea it's Noga Kevoda Donai. Your turn. Verse four. Then the glory of Hashem rose up from the cherubim and rested upon the threshold of the temple. The temple was filled with the cloud, and the courtyard was filled with the glow of the glory of Hashem. Okay. So then what happens is we have a similar dis description of what we saw in the first chapter about the chariot. Okay. Um, if th these are verses 9 to 17, if you look at verses 9 to 17, you'll see it's again, he talks about this wheels and the, and the animals and how they look like, and, and they, they have this multi-directional ability, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Very, very similar to what he said in the first chapter. I don't see any reason to repeat that. What is important in the middle of that description, he says the following, I am now on Verse 15. Okay. <laughs> okay. So if you remember, the first prophecy he's giving where? At the same river, Nahar What's the name of the city? Remember? From last week? Tel Aviv. Remember? Right? It's the city of Tel Aviv. Of course, not the modern city of Tel Aviv. The city of Tel Aviv on the river Kvar. Correct. Which we think is the rephrase. So, but what he says is, we already know that those are keruvim, those animals are keruvim. They are kind of lifted. These are the animals, he says, these are the animals I saw already five years ago when I was in the Harkval in Tel Aviv. And what happens? This vehicle is going to start going up. It's like, uh, think of a chopper. It goes up. Okay. Um, now we're gonna figure out why, because that's the important stuff. So I'm I'm going to verse 18. Okay. Verse 18. And it says the following. And I'm in the wrong chapter, so this is why I can't find that. But yet say Okay, this is very important. So this chariot, this vehicle, this chopper is being used for what? To carry the Shrina, the glory of God from the temple. So that means, so to say, think about the glory of God as, I don't know, something, whatever the image that comes to your mind, a cloud, whatever you want to have. Think about this cloud that has this ability to move and it goes from the Kruvim, where those Kruvim are in the temple, right? The Kruvim are Me'ala Kaporet. So, there's the Shechina on top of those Kruvim and the Shechina, the glory of God, 
travels into that chopper, goes into that chopper. Air Force One, okay? And gets there. Now, in the next couple of sukim, Yechezkel is going to describe the journey that this chopper, this chariot, this vehicle is going to do. Pasuk Yutet. Okay. It's still this hovering. Is, it's still hovering above them. It's now they're going to start moving. You'll see in a second. Okay. So now Yechezkel for the first time understand the meaning of the Chayot of the Kruvi and the whole thing that he saw in the first chapter. He says in Pasuk Kaf, "This is the animal that I've seen under God." In Nehar Kvar, meaning five years ago in Tel Aviv. Now we understand that what he called animals are the Kruvim, the cherubs, those angelic, whatever you want to call them, beings. It's not regular animals. Now we understand that. It took him five years. Now we understand that it's the glory of God that was upon those Kruvim. Now we understand that the Shekhinah leaves Beit HaMikdash and it's being carried by the Kruvim. But what happens? Now it's a different set of Kruvim. So the glory of God, the Shekhinah was on Kruvim in the Kaporet, right where the Aaron, the Ark was in the temple. And the Shekhinah is moving from those Kruvim to the Kruvim that are on the chariot. Different sets of Kruvim, cherubs, whatever that means. Yes. Beit Adonai Hakadmoni. It means it's the Eastern Gate. Correct. It's the Eastern Gate. Old, no, it's the Eastern Gate. Is that what they do it also in the English? That's the translation? Okay, in the French it is, okay. Eastern Gate, good. So now, basically to make things simpler, simple, that chariot, that chopper is God's vehicle, right? Um, it's a chopper because it, <laughs> it goes in the air. Okay, now, so they're leaving the Mikdash and they're gonna have a stop. We're gonna go to on Perik Yudalev, go to the next chapter, chapter 11, verses um, 22 and 23. וייסוע קרובים את כנפיהם והאופנים לעומתם וכבוד אלוהי ישראל עליהם מלמעלה ויעל כבוד אדוני מעל תוך העיר ויעמוד על ההר אשר מקדם לעיר. Exactly. So now, and this is why, Hannah, your question was very good. It goes through the Eastern Gate, 
right? The chair, the, 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 the chopper is going through the eastern gate, eastern gate. It's like, to me, it's more of like a drone, probably. You know, okay, anyway, um, <laughs> goes through the eastern gate and goes east. And it's going to stop on that mountain that is east of the city. What is mount, what mountain is east of the city? Olive, Olive Mountain. Okay, but this is only a temporary, that's only a temporary stop because what's going to happen? It's going to continue further east all the way to Babylon, to Babel. It's going to go all the way to Babel. And that's very significant. Why? Because it's these are all the academies are going to be, but that that's before the academies. It means that that's where all the Jews are. It means this, the Shechina is going to go wherever the Jewish people are. The Shechina is lo, not limited. Vast majority. Vast majority. What? Okay, the vast majority of the Jewish people are going to be in Babylonia. And the Shekhinah is going to go with them. Which tells you on a theological aspect, the religion is for the people. It's about the people. God's glory is going to go wherever the people are, not the other way around. What does it mean, by the way? Even to America. Even to America. What does it mean? We need to be worthy of that. Yes. Yes. All the way in the Midbar. All the way in the Midbar. No, but you would think that, you know, once they settled, okay, once the Jewish people build a home for Akadosh Baruch Hu, that's it. It's going to stay there. Akadosh Baruch Hu, in other words, says, the house is meaningless. And by the way, remember Zechariah? Remember... Not Zechariah, Yirmiyahu, you remember Ishaya, they say, Lama Who needs all that stuff? All those rituals, all those temples, all those buildings, all that stuff that you do. If you're removed from the core ideas of what you're supposed to be doing, which is a just, a, a society that is just, that takes care of the orphan, the widow, the stranger, the people who live in the margins of society, if you are removed from, if you don't follow the core values of a just society. Who needs that? It's just a piece of real estate. It's meaningless. I don't, God says, I don't need it. God never breaks the covenant, it's, but it takes two for a covenant. Correct. God, God doesn't break the covenant. God breaks the stones, breaks the building. Okay. Okay. Let's move on. So, as I, said, as I said before, Echezkel is going to see the, that drone, the Merkava, is going to see one more time in the chapters at the end of the book, what we call the Pirkei Geula, the, 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 the chapters of redemption, starting from, um, as I said, starting from chapter 40 on, he describes the third temple in details. And over there, at the end, maybe when we get there, if Mashiach is going to come. Um, oh, yeah, I saw that big sign on Robertson. You're right. I forgot. Um, <laughs> um, inside Joe, guys, don't worry. Um, from starting chapter 40, he did, he, he describes in great details the third chapter. And what happens over there, he also, he sees the Merkava in the third time. So first time in Perik Aleph, second time, as we said, in Perik Yud, Yud Aleph. And then the third time is going to be at the end of the book. Let's flip into Perik Mem Gimel, chapter 43. OK? 
Okay, 43, and I'm looking at verses two and three. Forty-three, two and three. Okay, chapter forty-three, verses two and three. Says the following. Actually, here, let me just just before we read it. The chariot is going to do the opposite direction. Remember, what direction, which direction did we take earlier? Mizraha. Now we're going to go from east to west. And what's going to happen at the end? The Shekhinah is going to rest back in the Mikdash, in the third temple. Let's take a look. I'm in Pasuk Bet. והנה כבוד אלוהי ישראל בא מדרך הקדים וקולו כקול מים רבים והארץ האירה מכבודו וכמראה המראה אשר ראיתי כמראה אשר ראיתי בבואי לשחד את העיר ומראות כמראה אשר ראיתי אל נהר כבר ואפול על פניי וכבוד אדוני, I'm going to פסוק ד' וכבוד אדוני בא אל הבית דרך שער אשר פניו דרך הקדים, אוקיי? Okay? דרך הקדים, meaning from מזרח קדים into the west. So now, and he says, oh, let's read the English, I'm sorry. Uh, two, three, and four. Okay. Now we have the answer for our question. Cheskel sees the Merkava already in Perek Aleph, in his what we call Nebuat HaHakdasha. Remember, in the first prophecy in which God basically tells him, you're going to be my prophet. Right? That's the first prophecy. It's called Nebuat HaHakdasha, and every prophet goes through that. Now, why he sees that already in the very beginning? Because of the central role that this chariot is going to have throughout his career as a prophet. Okay? The journeys of the prophet represent the destruction and the redemption. The departure of the Shekhinah from the temple and the return of the Shekhinah into the temple. And that is the main theme of the book. The book starts with the exile and ends with the return to Zion, with the redemption. Now we understand why the multi-directional of this chariot. Why? Because it doesn't have only one direction. In every moment, the chariot can go any direction. It can take the Shekhinah to wherever is needed. Even to the US, wherever the Jewish people are going to be. And it represents also the options from the Mikdash and into the Mikdash. Now, in order to understand what is the meaning of the Merkava a little bit 
further, we need to explore that idea of the Merkava through the prism of other books in the Bible and see how the Merkava is part of a much bigger vision or a bigger concept in Tanakh. Make sense? As I said last week, actually, I said, Yechezkel is not the only one who describes the Merkava. He's not the only prophet, but he's the only one that describes it in detail. And it's a central theme in his prophecy. But he's not the only one. I want to summarize for just a second what do we know about the Merkava? Four animals in four directions, and they carry something. Those animals have the face of a man, lion, bull, eagle, and they are called keruvim. Underneath them, there's the ofanim. So by the way, now, if it clicks, when we talk, when we, if, on, on our tefillah every day, when we say, ofanim bechayot hakodesh, or Kruvim, we, we, we use those words in our tefillot. So now we understand what we're, and by the way, in what context we say those words in the tefillah? We say kadosh, 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 next to it, and baruch kvod Adonai mim komo. Baruch kvod Adonai mim komo is, is the pasuk that Yechezkel says. Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh is the pasuk that who says? Isaiah, well, yes, both Yechezkel and Isaiah says that's what the angel, those chayot, kruvim, ofanim, chayot hakodesh, they say it. But who gives us the information? Who reports to us? So the pasuk that Baruch Vod Adonai Komo is given to us by Yechezkel. The pasuk of Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh is given to us by Isaiah. Isaiah also sees the Merkava. Doesn't describe in details like Yechezkel, but he says also that that's what they say, the Chayot, the Kruvim, that's what they do. They do Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. So the rabbis, what they do is combine the two, the two pictures, one from Isaiah, one from Yechezkel. Boom, now I have the complete picture of what's happening up there. Ah, that's what they do. Now think about the beginning of Kedusha. What do we say? We're going to sacrifice, sanctify your name just like he's been sanctified up there by all those angelic animals, the chayot, the kubim, the ofanim, the whatever, all those. So what do we do when we say kadosh, 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 and we say baruch vod Adonai mim komo, what do we do? We imitate them. We say, if it's good enough for the angels, it's good enough for us. Now we understand what we're doing in every day in the tefillah. Not exactly. Yechezkel comes later. Yishaya, Yishaya, Yishaya. No, Yishaya was dead already for a while. Yishaya talks, he prophesies before destruction of the temple. Yechezkel starts his career at the last five years of the temple, and then he gets the message that the temple is destroyed. He's already in, in, in Bavel when the temple is destroyed, right? As I mentioned, he's exiled to Bavel 11 years before the destruction. Um, it's what we call Galut Yeho Yachin. It's like the upper class was, was um, shipped out. And and only when he is, only when he receives the, the message, there's a messenger that comes and tells him that the temple was destroyed. Only then he starts his, he starts talking. So he's for five years, remember, his five years is going to be silent. That's what God told him. You're going to be my prophet, but now you're going to be silent for five years. Okay, that's in the first chapter. So, so now you understand what's, what's going on and what we do like in, so when we talk in the tefillah, when we say kadosh, 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 
and we say the hachayot, the ofanim, right? All that kind. Of, you understand where it comes, what it, where it comes from, and what the significance. Yeah. Questions? Yes. No. And I said that last week. I can't because who knows what's the symbolism of that stuff. And uh, I'm trying to describe what we do know and, um, and what does it mean to us. <coughs> okay, so we have the Kuvim, we have the Ofanim. What is the color? Somebody asked me, Hannah asked me last week. Ke'ein nechoshet kalal. Remember? The color of those of those chayot is ke'ein nechoshet kalal, which means copper, right? But it's a radiant copper. And the Cheskel also tells us that from, um, from that chariot, we have this, like a sound of water. He says, Vaishmait kol kanfehem ke kol maim rabim, like great water. Think about, I don't know, if, I mean, this is California, but um, some of us lived in New York, uh, Niagara Falls, for example. I don't know if you've been there. The noise, the noise is tremendous. So think about something like that, the imagery of like this huge sound of water. Okay. So this is what Yechezkel describes. Well, this description is extremely similar to another system. The system that we find in the temple, in Melachim Aleph, in the book of Kings 1. If anyone wants to uh, check that, but that's okay. You, you're going to take my word for it. So Shlomo builds the, yeah, you can check it over there. Uh, Shlomo builds the temple, right? And one of the things that he builds is this, um, they call it Yam Shel Shlomo. It's this huge body to collect water, okay? And next to it, there's like 10 sinks. Sink. sink for water, sink. And those sinks um, is placed, those, those sinks are placed on mechonot, stands. Okay, some sort of a base for those sinks. Okay, so far so good. Now all the details that we just described about the Merkava, we find them also in the description of all that system of that body of water and the sinks and all that kind of stuff. Okay? So that body of water, think about like a huge bath or a jacuzzi or something, whatever, okay? Huge one. He stand, he, it, <laughs> that bath is, is, is stands on special stands at what, guess what? No, four image of animals facing four directions. Omed al shnei asar bakar, shlosha aponim tzafona, ushlosha aponim yamma, Again, a system of animals, like image of animals, like stands in the shape of animals, and that huge bath is on them. How do you call those uh, baths that have like legs? Like a freestanding bath? I think something like that. That's, that's, I think that's the, the term. That kind of a thing. It's not like part of a structure. Footing, Footing tubs. Okay, I'll go with that. Now, those stands that the that are the basis for those sinks have also animals. 
Listen on the animals. Arayot, bakar, ukruvim. Well, guess what? It has also ofanim. Ve'arba'a ofanei nechoshet ramechona'a achat. Now we said, all those stuff is made out of, guess what? Copper. All that stuff is made out of copper. So we have like a whole system to collect water and to use water, okay? That's like, you know, the first description of, uh, of uh, you know, pipelines and whatever that we have, I guess, okay? Why is it so similar? And do you think it's a coincidence? I don't think so. The description and, and like, why is it the same model as the heavenly chariot? What's the connection between the two? Is there a connection between the two? This is similar, like there's something very simple. It's a basically a system of sink and a bath. So there's gonna be water coming from that bath into the, into the sink, right? The bath collects the water from the rain, etc. But why the significance? Why the, all the symbolism that tells us that it's so, so similar to that chariot, that drone, that, that the glory of God is used to move from one place to the other. What is very important for making something pure? Pure? I don't know if it's pure. It's the hell. Oh. So. We have it in lots of uh, rituals. Yeah, but I'm going to go with a different direction. So the question is, we're clear about the question. And I think we're going to answer that question next week. Because it's 12 o'clock. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. See you next week. Same time, same place. And um, thank you. Here also in person. Thank you. It was great as usual. Thank you.